Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I guess the first thing I wanted to mention is last Saturday's food, Johnson Food Shelf Drive, we brought in over 2,600 pounds of food, which was just great for the food shelf. Um, they're obviously very excited and a big shout out would go out to all the people who not only donated, but uh, helped set it up and organize it and participated. Uh, it was a it was a great thing for the community and uh, really appreciated by the Johnson Food Shelf. From the uh, emergency management front, we are now exploring how we would and when we would, how can we open the uh, some of the playgrounds, the skate park, et cetera. There'll be more coming on this as we go forward in the next week or so, but uh, we're looking at it now is how we'd be able to open up those parks and playgrounds in a safe manner and maintaining the, the restrictions that are being put down by the health department. Uh, if you watch the uh, governor's news conference today, he mentioned that June 1st would be opening of all the daycares. This, they would be allowed to uh, open back up and, and take uh, kids in, which will help with people going back to work, obviously. Uh, there will be some uh, restart grants available for daycare centers to reopen. I'm not sure exactly the details on that. I'm, I would expect that'll be coming out shortly and available to all of the daycare centers. They're also saying that the summer daycare will be able to open for day camps, as well as uh, some overnight camping at campgrounds and such uh, with certain uh, restrictions and qualifications. And I'm sure more on those will be coming out as the time moves forward. Uh, on the education front that he announced as well today, there would be limited graduations, like a virtually, virtual uh, graduation, or depending on what the uh, restrictions are for at the time of graduations for crowd sizes, there may be some kind of isolated graduation, depending on what where we are with the restrictions at that time. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more to learn on that as we go forward. Uh, the schools will remain closed for in-person education through the rest of this year. Uh, fall schools may open with in-person education. It'll all depend on the, the data that's available at that time for how many people are restrictions and, and uh, the such and where we are in the COVID-19. Um, I would just say that uh, our featured speaker next week is going to be the Secretary of Education, uh, uh, Daniel French. And so he may be able to enlighten us some more with some of those details of the education, our K through 12, not only here in Johnson, but around the whole county. And that may be of interest to a lot of people. On the select board front, uh, the Public Works Department. All of our employees are now back at work. Uh, there's some protocols and restrictions that we're having to follow, and those are being put in place now. Uh, by and large, we're gonna be working in uh, two separate crews. We have five uh, people headcount for our highway department, public works, and they're gonna be separated into two crews to do work so that maintain more social distancing. We, the town office is also open for appointment only with the attorneys that need to come in and do uh, title searches. And uh, the final property tax bill is coming up on uh, May 10th, it's in a couple of days. And there will be, for those with COVID-19 related issues, making their payments on a, a form that can be filled out and it would go to abatement and we would uh, more than likely grant us an extension for any of the penalty fees and the uh, interest costs. There'll be uh, 
So if anybody is struggling due to COVID-19, they will get one of those forms. I spoke to Gordy earlier today. He indicated he did not think he had anything for the village. However, I will open it up to Gordy if there is anything he wanted to add. I think we're all set for now, Eric. I do want to say, I don't know how you keep getting all these guest speakers, but you're doing one heck of a good job. Keep it up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and the format for tonight is our guest speaker is uh, Congressman Peter Welch, and he was going to talk to us about some of the federal assistance that has been made available, what's coming down the pipe, uh, what he anticipates, those sort of things, and then open it up for Q&A. Probably uh, we'll direct questions first for him and then open it up for general questions for anyone else. And then we're going to turn over to Lisa, who will, will do some up dates on the rec committee and what they're up to and then turn it over to Kyle for introducing the music and entertainment tonight. Uh, it looks like we do have a, an audience member asking to speak so okay go ahead. Hi thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all of your work. Um, I'm, my question is about um, village property tax relief as a landlord with many tenants who are unable to pay rent at this point in time, is there any relief um, come Monday when my property taxes are due? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. The, the property tax itself would still be due. However, we would not, we would be looking at abating any uh, late charges for late fees or, or interest. So you would get some extension of time, uh, but the, the tax bill is the tax bill. We wouldn't be able to uh, just forgive a tax bill. It's still a bit confusing. So um, I pay my taxes on Monday. Yeah. Um, um, but what if I pay them on Friday? Next Friday? Yeah. Yeah. They would be late, like I said, if you, if, and I, I believe, uh, let's see what the 10th is Sunday, right? So the, there would be a one day until the 11th before they're due. Uh, and that, when they, that cutoff is when they're due is when the uh, late fees kick in if they haven't been paid and then the interest starts occurring and it's pretty hefty interest. But we would send a form out to those that are delinquent to, uh, if it's completed, they can apply for an abatement and we would, okay. so you penalty. Okay, thank you very much, mm -hmm. Eric. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So do we have Congressman on yet? We have uh, Rebecca Ellis. Rebecca, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Uh, Hey, Brian. Hi, Eric. Hi, everyone. Um, yep, the congressman is on his way. Okay. So let's just keep looking for him to enter into the room. But just spoke with him, so I know he's... So you know what oh, he looks like. He's here. He's okay, here. I, yep. I see him. Okay, then I guess with that, uh, it would bring me great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Con Congressman Peter Welch to our uh, Friday Zoom cast. Uh, I know we had invited him to come back to Johnson for a I'm visit this summer, but this is not what we intended. But we thank you for coming back, Congressman. Go ahead. Can you see me? No, I cannot. I don't know what I did wrong. I was on there for a minute. Oh, I got it. Yeah. There, there we, we go. We can see you now. <laughs> Um, it's really calling. great to see you. Um, I'm I'm really eager to hear about you, but you know, there's, um, it's just astonishing wh what's happened. Uh, as as you all know, and you have to contend with the fallout, which is very significant at the local level. And I really appreciate it, uh, the work that you're doing now, and the work that you're going to have to do in the future. Um, you know, it's been a huge 
uh, response, first by the governor, and he has the primary obligation to protect the health and well-being of the citizens. And he makes those decisions much more than anything in Washington. And in my view, he's doing a good job. He understands that this COVID virus is fierce and that the social distancing is essential uh, to try to protect us. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate uh, what he is doing and how he's doing it based on data, based on facts. But the immediate consequence, the collateral consequence of uh, the <clears throat> uh, social distancing is we're turning the lights off on the economy. And I'm sure you're seeing that uh, in Johnson. And uh, it's brutal. Uh, uh, we've got the highest unemployment rate uh, in the country since the Great Depression. Uh, and a lot of folks who lost their job, lost their health care. Uh, everybody lives with the anxiety about whether they'll get sick or somebody they love uh, will get sick. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the challenge for our smaller businesses is really, really tough because the revenues have collapsed. <clears throat> they have relationships with their employees and they have to try to figure out how and whether they'll be able to make it to the other side. Now, the congressional response so far has been massive, uh, you know, about $3 trillion, and that's borrowed money. You know, this is a situation where uh, the house is on fire. If you don't have enough money to pay for the hose, you've got to borrow the money uh, to put the fire out. Uh, and it's had some effect, but no one has the illusion that it's anything close to going back to a no normal when you don't have uh, this kind of federal activity. But you know, those checks, we've had over $484 million distributed in Vermont on the $1,200 checks. <clears throat> Some of the paper checks still haven't gone out, but that's significant input. Not, not a substitute for a salary by any means. The unemployment benefits, <clears throat> it's an extra $600 on top of whatever a person is eligible for under Vermont. But, um, uh, uh, and and the, those checks are starting to go out. The governor's worked hard to, uh, to, to, to get those out. And what is new in the relief package that is really important is that folks who are self-employed or independent contractors are eligible for that $600. <clears throat> in the past, they haven't been. And then uh, the uh, payroll protection plan, the PPP as it's called, uh, has been good for the per people in the businesses that it works for. Uh, and that's not everybody, but about 10,000 businesses have qualified and uh, there's about a billion and a half dollars associated with that that's going to help some of those businesses hang on. The problem is that the PPP just isn't designed, it was designed on the fly, uh, to help in a number, of, of a whole host of businesses uh, that are typical in Vermont, especially restaurants. So one of the things my, I'm hoping that we'll do in the next round, which may be the end of next week, uh, is to get added flexibility so that the objective of the PPP program to help our small businesses can actually work. And what that flexibility would mean is two things. One, <clears throat> extend the date by which they have to use it to the end of the year as opposed to the end of uh, the middle of June because uh, a restaurant, for instance, they might be able to have employees come back, but they, if they don't have customers come back, the employees aren't going to have anything to do. And the other is to have a little more latitude uh, on how they can spend it. it. It goes mostly to employees, and that's a good thing, uh, but there are fixed costs that a lot of these small businesses continue to have to pay, even as the revenues have, have, have vanished. Uh, so, you know, we've, uh, uh, we've got to be constantly making the adjustments required to achieve the goal, which is to help businesses survive. Uh, the next CARES package, <clears throat> I believe, is going to focus largely on aid to the states and local communities, and obviously that'll be of interest to you. And I believe that is absolutely essential. You know, the federal government is the only entity and government that has the fiscal flexibility uh, in the fiscal capacity to essentially 
uh, step in and provide relief. Uh, that all of the, the budget problems we're going to face in Vermont can find their way squeezed down to the local community. And uh, you know, our revenues are down about 50, 50, I think, million this year. And this is only for the last quarter. And it could be close to half a billion next year. So my hope is that two things. One, there is a very, very big package of state of aid to the states. And number two, that we allow significant flexibility so that the states and the communities can decide how best to distribute that. Uh, I do believe that it's much more suitable for Montpelier, the governor and the General Assembly to decide where and how to spend the money. Uh, and in addition, there is a lot of discussion about having some money go directly to communities and how that formula would work. Uh, I just don't know at this point. So that's kind of where we're at. <clears throat> you know, in Vermont, we're doing good on flattening the curve. Uh, but as we all know, if uh, we're not careful, uh, we could have uh, a, a significant outbreak. So how we manage this going forward is really, really important. Uh, the one area where I'm extremely concerned is the federal government not doing its job <clears throat> on the testing, contact tracing, and uh, 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 quarantine front. Uh, you have to have the testing centralized. You can't have 50 governors trying to figure out what's the best test and then to try to compete for supplies. You have to have personal protective equipment, the things we need centralized. That has to be a federal function so you don't have hospitals competing with one another. And there has to be a real commitment uh, to get the resources to states to do the contact tracing and to do the, uh, uh, the quarantine, the isolation, where the countries that have done that, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, uh, have been quite successful in uh, significantly reducing uh, the number of cases and the deaths and in some of those countries, they've actually been able to maintain their economy. They haven't had to shut down because they've had such active, aggressive and effective testing, contact tracing and quarantining. So uh, that's a report from my end. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm at home, uh, working largely from home as is my staff. Uh, Rebecca Ellis, my state director is on the call with us and she's calling in from home, and I assume most of you, all of you are at home. Why don't I stop there, and Eric, I'll turn it over to you, and I look forward to uh, hearing your comments, doing my best to answer questions, but uh, really, really eager to hear how you're coping with this. Well, I, I think from a, a town's perspective, we are coping very well. Uh, we've had you know, great cooperation from all of the uh, community. They're all, uh, and that's one reason maybe why Johnson has had zero known positives in his community, because uh, everybody is taking it very serious <coughs> and by and large. Uh, and we've been very uh, successful so far. So far, I, I would yeah, echo some concerns we have going into rippling out the the uh, the economic impact that's going to hit the town you know we're not feeling it yet but that's sort of down the road uh some of the revenue that we have that comes in is probably not going to be there but i would like to at this point have brian uh take over and and get some of the people out there that would like to ask you some questions directly and have them give them the opportunity. So, Brian, if there's anybody that's raising their hand, can you uh, unmute them? We've got a few folks with their hands raised. So, I'm going to start with uh, we've got a a caller, um, the caller who had raised their hand. I've unmuted you. Hi, that's Roger Marku, uh, and I had a question before the Senate or the Congressman got on the line. And I'll I'll wait to, to talk about that later. But while I'm on the line, uh, Congressman Welch, Roger Marku, good to hear your voice. Okay, good, Roger. It's good to hear from you. I enjoyed my visit. Yes, uh, um, I'll, I'll I won't take up the airtime here because I know there's a lot of other people uh, um, on the line. But 
hope that you and the family are well. Representative Matt Hill. Uh, Congressman, thank you for joining Hi. us. Um, it's good to see you again. Yes. Um, you, you know, I rose my hand um, and then you answered a bunch of my questions. <laughs> And, and there are more. There are more so just the comments. Um, but you know, as as you very well know from your time in the Senate uh, and before, Vermont is made up of a, a very large number of very small businesses. Um, and you know, uh, for the Vermont economy backbone is small business, and they aren't doing great right now. Um, and uh, one of the biggest complaints about the, the previous round of of uh, of you know of the stimulus package, um, the money went out the door before <clears throat> small businesses could get um, some relief. Um, so just I just want to reiterate that, and uh, you know we you know it, it, it's not a uh, a done deal, but I really hope that our restaurants, as you um, pointed out specifically, and some of our small businesses will get some um, you know some much needed relief. Uh, and, uh, and and thank you again for all you're doing. Um, and, and and I hope uh, the next round um, can be targeted. Also, I appreciate your your comments about um, having the state um, having some flexibility on spending. That's really important. You know, um, every state's a little different. Every town's a little different. Every county's a little different. Um, the money needs to go in slightly different areas depending on where you are. Um, so I'd really appreciate some flexibility um, if you're able to. Um, leverage that in the in the Congress and uh, give us um, some more flexibility on, on on where those dollars are most needed. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, I really do think uh, you're better suited. And th by the way, you you may not be thanking me for the favor because the needs are great, as you know, in Vermont. And uh, these are in the the resources are not infinite. Even you know that first round we got 1.2 billion, but I, the, the, so these will be hard because uh, it is tough and everybody needs a lot of help, especially our small businesses. But those are going to be tough uh, decisions. But uh, I do agree that you're in the position better to make them in Montpelier than we are in D.C. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, and Beth, boy, uh, hey. you're unmuted. Hey, Beth. Hey. Hello, thank you for joining us. Um, I have some questions around, so funding is obviously what matters most to everyone right now. Um, and you're fully aware of the situation with our Vermont State Colleges. Um, mm -hmm. It is my personal mission to do all I can to keep our state colleges uh, alive and well. Um, so my question for you is, um, how can the federal government help us with facilitating and funding um, our state colleges to keep them up and running, uh, both in relation to <coughs> the impact COVID has had and also, um, you know, just more generally, um, because the impact of losing these colleges would be um, significant and um, frank frankly devastating to our community and to many others. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your advocacy. And of course, uh, uh, there was a huge outcry uh, that was effective uh, in uh, pushing back on the recommendation that the uh, former chancellor made. Uh, and that is because what you said, I think, is widely uh, uh, acknowledged, and that is the importance of the educational services that are provided, but the vital importance of those institutions in your communities. Um, there's there's two things here. One is higher education in general has really been hammered. Uh, I mean, just take the situation for the Massey colleges and the particulars of its situation. Every higher education institution has been really hit hard by this because you had to do distance learning, you had to make uh, refunds to room and board. Um, and now I, I hate to see this, but colleges are getting sued uh, because of distance learning not being the same thing as on campus learning uh, and <clears throat> the um, that's all COVID related and in initial legislation there was some money included for the colleges and that can be distributed I think uh, I forget what the formula is but that is a modest amount of money uh, and it would be 
avail to the extent it's available it would be to all our edu higher education institutions not just uh, uh, a single one okay um, my view is that in the next package we actually have to do more for higher education in general uh, because it has been hit so hard and there's enormous worry about enrollments for the next year you know now is the time when a lot of prospective students would be coming up to do campus visits and they can't come they can't leave where they are and they can't come here so i'd like to see us have a significant allocation of money for high, for higher education uh to account for COVID. second <clears throat> if we are successful in getting a big check to Vermont, then you'll be able to make your case in Montpelier uh, with respect to how that gets allocated and distributed. And I think those are the two approaches where there can be some potential benefit for not just the Vermont State Colleges, but uh, our other higher education institutions. I don't think we'd be able to get in this bill a particular appropriation for an institution. You know what I mean? So you'd like us to, if we could get something just for Vermont State Colleges from Washington, then obviously every other institution is gonna be making its case there. So there is gonna be money, but I think the decision is gonna ultimately be made in Montpelier. Thank you. Uh, Mark Woodward, uh, I've got you unmuted. Thank you. Um, so, Representative Welch, I'm, I'm watching people up here that are trying to telecommute and it is not happening <coughs> on these back roads. And I'm hoping that the federal government will really seriously consider spending money on, on infrastructure, and I mean particularly broadband, in these rural towns. Because <clears throat> as far as I can see, the, the federal data out there says, oh, Johnson's 95% covered and a lot of these towns are, and in reality, they're not. That is bad data and we really, in order for people to actually telecommute, we need, we really need help getting it out to <coughs> back the last mile. Mark, you're right. And those maps are bogus. You know, I, and we actually got, I challenged them with the FCC when they were into the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, because they were in there telling us that we had this wild high percentage of coverage when in fact we didn't as you as you just said but I think we've got a shot at getting significant broadband for rural America because what's happened in this uh, with our stay at home stay safe approach and this is all around the country you can't stay at home and go to the doctor if you don't have high-speed internet for telemedicine you can't stay home and do your homework unless you have high-speed internet. You can't stay home and work unless you have high-speed internet. So the need is existential. This is not incidental. So a lot of us have been making the case that, hey, this is a decision that in the 1930s, <clears throat> there was, we decided to electrify America, including rural America. It was seen as a necessity. And that's where we're at now with uh, broadband. Uh, so we are working uh and i'm part of the task force a 10 member task force in the house uh that's rolling out an approach to get the money to the communities uh, you'd have to figure out in a lot of ways what's the best means by which you do it because i don't want this just to be money that goes to the comcast and the big players but thank you focuses on on community uh service where i have confidence that if johnson is making a decision about how to deploy, your bottom line is gonna be what's good for your residents as opposed to what's good for your pocketbook. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, Leah Kilvaniova. Um, hi. Um, I also would like to talk about broadband. Um, I have been following up very closely what has been happening at the state level. Um, there is there are meetings every week either with the House Energy and Technology Committee or Senate Finance um, and as many of you may know there has been an emergency broadband plan released for comment earlier this week um, I have also been looking into the various funding sources that are currently available for the build out of the broadband infrastructure 
And unfortunately, uh, in relation to the build out, um, my understanding is that a lot that the 1.2 billion package that is coming to Vermont is for projects that can prove uh, expenditures occurring in 2020. And that's a really big hindrance to a meaningful broadband build out in many parts of Vermont. Um, and you indicated that you are a part of a task force mm -hmm. that is looking into this further. What I wonder is if there are going to be any other additional resources available beyond what we know needs to be spent in 2020 for communities to build out. Um, and I know that an additional resource is an upcoming Federal Communications Commission's auction, uh, right. for which I know that a small portion of Johnson is eligible, provided there is a carrier that is going to bid on the, on the territory. Um, we are also working locally to to um, to advance broadband, but we are not at a point where we would be able to take advantage of those resources now. Therefore, anything that is upcoming that would be available a little <coughs> later on when we are actually prepared to access the resources would be great to have a knowledge of. Well, as soon as I know, you'll know. Um, it'll be that quick. But the uh, number one. The first, uh, that 1.2 billion does have restrictions on it. And a number of us are saying that they've got to be COVID related. But what I've observed, everything's COVID related at this point. It's so turned our economy upside down that everything uh, traces back to COVID. So a number of us uh, are trying in the next package to get more flexibility for the money that has already been distributed to Vermont. Second, um, the 2020 timetable doesn't make any sense. I mean, this has got to, you, the communities are going to have to figure out what's the best way to do it. And that's a hard examination. You know, we're, I, I'm, I'm in Norwich. <clears throat> we have EC fiber, but, and that's a great model and they've been very successful, but that took a lot of time and effort and local involvement for people to come to the conclusion uh, about signing up for EC fiber. So I don't want to put artificial deadlines on communities. Uh, I want to make sure that when you're making a decision, you're confident you're making the right decision for, for your community. Um, and you're going to have to live with that because there's a real self-interest in the community that's making a decision about how to do it, that you get it right. I mean, you know, people want that high speed. Well, I don't know what's right for you guys. And, and you know, I don't know the technical stuff. I, so I do want there to be flexibility for you both with respect to the timeline um, and the means by which you accomplish the goal. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, and I've got uh, Eric Hutchins up next. Okay, Eric, go ahead. Uh, hi, Congressman Welch. It's, uh, hey, Eric. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I, I want you to know before I make my comments that I've, I've voted for you for a long time. Uh, I, even in 1990, when you lost the governor's race to Dick Snelling, I voted for you. So I am a supporter, <laughs> though it might not sound that way from what I'm about to say. Um, right. uh, I, I think that you're, 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 your heart's in the right place with the idea that we, you know, we are looking at terrible revenue shortfalls that are going to mean either massive tax increases and or uh, deep austerity like cuts to important social services uh education is one i'm a high school teacher here uh in Omel county um is one that we have to face in in general uh and so getting money for the states to spend at the state's discretion is is the right idea but how are you going to do that? Because uh, I have to say that the first the CARES bill that came out is an abomination. It is shameful. The money spigots have been turned on for corporations to the tune of $800 billion for Steve Mnuchin to hand out whoever he pleases. Yet uh, American citizens got 1200 bucks, which would be lucky to get most people through two weeks. So, you know, <coughs> you're in the majority party. You're, you're the only person in Vermont right now you're in the majority party in the House, and you, the, the bill has, that comes out has to go through you. How are you going to get a bill out that doesn't involve another half a trillion dollars in handouts 
to companies that could easily go through structured bankruptcy. That just saves investors and hedge fund managers. How are you gonna get a bill through that's gonna save Main Street and not Wall Street? Because we desperately, desperately need it. And what I'm hearing from Mitch McConnell is they want you guys to vote to uh, allow states to declare bankruptcy. So federal judges can then uh, void union contracts, void obligations to pension funds, et cetera. Uh, so I wanna hear that you're not gonna make any more concessions and to Wall Street and that how are we going to get a real, real bailout bill for the citizens who need it most and these, and these unbelievable revenue gaps that the state's facing. I'm so proud of my community and my state and the governor and the volunteers in this community, but we need help badly. What, how are you, you going to do it? <coughs> well, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, let, let me respond a couple of ways because number one, um, our, the, there's real inadequacies if, with what we did to meet the need of our small businesses. I mean, I've been spending a lot of time talking to dairy. They're hammered and there's not meaningful relief for them. To our restaurants where the PPP program that's theoretically available to them it just simply doesn't work. That wasn't something we did in Congress. It was something that happened when the guidelines were written by the SBA, okay? Uh, so there I'm trying to change those guidelines uh, so that it would be a useful uh, assistance to the, to the small businesses. Um, third, <clears throat> the, um, I wouldn't use the word abomination. Uh, it's, not as, it's not as ideal as we want. Uh, the part about it that is an abomination is there were uh, provisions in there that are going to be a bonanza to the real estate uh, industry with loss carryback, and that's several. That's a couple of hundred billion dollars. I did not know that was in the bill. It was probably put in at Trump's request, for all I know. Uh, so there are things in there that are not good. <clears throat> also, I uh, don't think that those big companies like Ruth Chris Steakhouse, Steakhouse and Shake Shack is in getting the PPP when they've got a balance sheet that would give them some room to weather it. Um, or any of these companies where they did stock buybacks, you know, it was supposed to have a cash uh, cushion to help them through tough times. But I really would dispute, well, I'll say two things where I disagree with you a bit. One is, I was there in 19, <clears throat> pardon me, 2009 for the bank bailout. Uh, this is way, way, way more focused on Main Street. Um, and that, you know, it's the $1,200 check. It's the unemployment benefits where we had a big fight with Senator McConnell that adds 600 bucks and adds eligibility to a self-employed person or an independent contractor like an Uber driver uh, or somebody who uh, plows driveways uh, in the winter and does landscaping in the summer. No, those, but, those but, but Pardon me, Congressman Welch, pardon me. The, that $500, $500 billion slush fund, there's which where there was limited oversight written into it, you don't have that oversight anymore. Steve Mnuchin no. can wave it all in a heartbeat. He can give it well, up. First of all, you, I, you'll be lucky I, to see wh where it goes. And the, I, what, what, what Main Street got was $287 billion. And like, I get, I get it, I get it. It's just, it's super frustrating. It's super yeah, frustrating. Yes. We're all seeing it. And, and there's, no, there's no covering it up. There's, there's no compromise here. Like, I, I would really like you to, to stand up and call it what it is. Well, I will call that out. I, we were against that. Pelosi was against it. But on this question of will we stand and fight, we are standing and fighting. But we don't control totally the outcome. And there's a price paid for inaction. You know, and there's a price paid for progress. And the cost of inaction, in my view, is greater than the price of action. So what you're expressing is a legitimate frustration. But if you have the view that I have the ability or the House, one branch of government, uh, is able to basically impose its will on the president and on Mitch McConnell, that that is not a power that I have or even Nancy Pelosi has. And Eric, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but I, I do have quite a few people waiting to speak. Uh, so if we have some time, maybe we can circle back. But uh, right now I'm going to call on uh, Senator Rich Westman. Uh, thanks for doing this, Peter. Hey, Richie. Margaret says hello. 
<laughs> I tell her I think she's wonderful. <laughs> um, I, I just want to um, relay to you the, the conversation in the Senate Appropriations Committee this afternoon. Um, we're very grateful to um, you and the delegation for the 1.2 billion. Um, it's way higher than um, um, any other state got, gets per capita. We're, um, we're in the nosebleed area for that. But the problem is we can't use any of it to backfill our state budget. And, and I want to change that. Yes, well, looking forward to this next year, we're facing right now a $400 million shortfall in state revenues, mm -hmm. which really means with federal match that our spending will have to drop about 25%, which will affect Medicaid, healthcare, everything. So not only do we need flexibility, we need a lot of money. And um, it, you know, this is, we need a, a big <clears throat> package to help us through this. So it isn't it, flexibility we have to have because we haven't got the ability to um, hold our budget together unless we get that flexibility but the amount has to be huge. Well, I, I agree with that. Um, and uh, Nancy Pelosi agrees with that. I mean, we've seen in the past that if we don't come to the aid of the states, then there are massive layoffs. Uh, and we're talking about firefighters. We're talking about police. We're talking about teachers. Uh, we're talking about healthcare workers. I mean, we're talking about basic services, not just in the state level, but at the community level as well. And what it also has happened time and again when the federal government has failed to step up with that big number you're saying uh, is that it's prolonged the recession and possible depression uh, that we're contending with. And I am all in on this. And my view um, is that. <clears throat> We're not going to get ex we're not going to get it exactly right, like fine tuning what the healthcare steps are that we should take. We're not going to get it exactly right uh, on the financial steps that we take. So, what's our choice? Our choice is to have a bias towards erring on the side of doing too much. You know, be a little slower on the uh, go going back to work, being a little more strict on the social distancing, because the worst thing that happens is that we take a little bit longer to make a lot more people safer. But I have the same view on the economic side. Uh, this is not a time uh, to start quibbling about whether we got it exactly right. Let's err on the side of doing it too much and doing it too soon rather than doing it too little and too late. So I've got that message, Richie, and I really believe that's right. But I, I really do think you've got to have the flexibility because these are tough calls that you've got to make. And, uh, uh, I mean, that's going to be a fierce debate there that you'll have, but it'll be the people who were affected having that debate. Hi, sorry, it's Jane Draper. Hi, Hi Jane, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Peter. Thank you for Hi. attending and helping us out. My question <coughs> is a little on the personal level and in regards to the United States Postal Service. So far, we have heard nothing that the Postal Service is going to be helped, Peter. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you are a member of the Postal Preservation Caucus that was just recently formed. Well, let, let me speak to that uh, directly, because you're right. In our last CARES package, as it passed the House, we had a significant bail. I, wanna, I don't want to call it a bailout. It's significant help to the post office. Calling a bailout is unfair to the post office because uh, it's burdened with these pre-funding uh, requirements that way exceed any actuarial standards. So the Postal Service has been up against the wall for congressionally imposed burdens, not just the internet, email, and so on. But we in the House are totally uh, committed to funding the post office. We have to have it, in fact, now more than ever, okay? Um, in the negotiations, it was President Trump himself who was absolutely adamant that he would not sign a bill that continued to carry the money from the House bill for the Postal Service. And he's got a beef with Jeff Bezos. He thinks the Postal Service doesn't charge enough to Amazon. 
well, whatever his point of view is on that, whether he's right or wrong, he's got to be with the Postal Service, and he's really the huge impediment. And that, you know, that's one of those practical problems, that one way or the other, we got to get the president to sign this. I believe in our next package, we're going to try to help to get that Postal Service aid in there again. And I absolutely know in, in the significant majority in the House, I think even a bunch of Republicans agree, uh, whether we can get that past McConnell and Trump, uh, time will tell. But I hear you, and I know you're right. Okay. Thank you, as always, for your support, Peter. Th thanks, Jane. Thank you. And uh, Brian Schaefer, you're up next. Thanks so much, uh, Congressman Welsh. Great to see you again. Yeah. Uh, for those of us in Vermont, we are um, very much dug in on the ground. Um, <laughs> we, my boy Bastion here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as a high school principal, um, I understand you're talking about big things, uh, about the budget that's coming down the pike, the battles that you have. Um, I'm more focused on the concrete and the now. Whereas we have a prom that's been canceled, we have a graduation ceremony, which we'd love to host. I'm just wondering if there are federal resources that would be made available to us um, so that we could Zoom, uh, broadcast, make sure that our seniors in Vermont are celebrated as well they should in the class of 2020. Wow, what a, what a great um, uh, principal you are you know, keeping your mind on what's important to the kids. It's been such a tough time, I think, for high school seniors. I'd love to hear about that sometime, but to have uh, that Zoom approach or something that acknowledges uh, this very special moment is important. I actually don't know of any federal resources for that. I mean, the money that's come back to the state, that specific thing you're talking about uh, that is so important for the high school students, you know, frankly, that's not something where we can put a line item in the budget for. That's why I'm in favor of discretion uh, being exercised at the, at the state level and even the local level. So whether there is some possibility, it's not federal resources for Zoom, it would just, it's a check, it's money you might need for it. Uh, so I don't see that as being a specific item that would be in a CARES package, but I see that as a important objectives that you want to achieve and whether there's some resources that have come into the state through the federal cares package that would be available for that task i think you'd have to really follow up in montpelier uh, with that question because every high school is probably going to want to do that i hope thank you uh and then i've got ellen from the studio center hi peter Hey, um, you, hi, nice to see you. Thank you for all you're doing for us. Um, you mentioned earlier that <clears throat> there might be more flexibility on the PPP, and I'm curious to know when and uh, who's making that decision. Is that SBAs, is it regulatory, or is it uh, Congress, or how is that gonna get sorted out? And well, why there's, there's, two, there's two approaches here. One is it could be done by the SBA, uh, in the Treasury Department. And Patrick Bernie and I sent a letter to Secretary Mnuchin urging him to provide that flexibility. So it's within the power of the administration uh, and the bureaucracy to do it. But as a backup, we're proposing legislation that addresses what I've heard of the two major concerns. One is the timeline. It's just too tight. And I'll give the in restaurant example. They could hire their people back but even if we're allowed to go to restaurants, we all know it's going to take a while for the public to be confident. Also, restaurants are going to have to social distance. So a place that had 100 seats might only have 35. So the revenues aren't going to be there. And we want to give that flexibility so that they can get the benefit of the program consistent with the facts on the ground in the restaurant. The second area is it's a 75 25 75 for labor and 25 for expenses i think we might have to adjust that some especially where some of these employees are doing okay financially with unemployment all right so the goal of ppp um, is really to try to help those businesses be able to survive and i imagine you've got a lot of challenges obviously at the studio center so that is what we're trying to put in the legislation 
So whether the, if, if Mnuchin acts before us, great. If he doesn't and we legislate it, then fine. But we do want to get you that flexibility. Quick follow up, any guess on whether the administration will act on this in a timely way? Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I just don't know. And Mnuchin has actually been, from what I understand, talking to Pelosi, he's been okay to deal with on these things. And the, the kind of thing you and I are talking about right now, I'm sure my Republican colleagues are hearing the same thing from the small businesses in their community. So I don't see why there'd be a political downside to uh, Mnuchin uh, being accommodating, but whether and when and uh, how soon, I don't know. Um, and other things like the Postal Service, where there's a common need for us to have a good Postal Service. We're just dealing with the president who's got a thing against the Postal Service and is willing to use uh, the power that he has, and it's substantial, to say, no, I won't sign a bill that helps the Postal Service. That's outrageous. Outrageous. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, <coughs> so I've got Scott Meyer. Takes a second. Okay, there you go, Scott. <laughs> Uh, Scott, we're, we're getting some interference on, on your microphone again. He's, he's, Scott speaks Klingon. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I'm going to come back to Scott. Uh, Lynn had asked uh, to speak in chat. Uh, so, Lynn? Hi. Um, hi. Thank you for your time today. Um, this is my husband, Alan. Hi. How are you doing? Um, I hey. just, hi. <laughs> Um, we just wanted that opportunity to talk to you about some concerns that we have and we have had. It's in respects to uh, protection of the public and in regards to repeating offenders, as well as how our laws are not helping both the public for their protection and safety, number one to me. And number two is we're not really helping these repeating offenders um, stop repeating in the sense of, I feel like there's no consequences to our current laws. Um, for instance, we've had a, rep a repeated offender steal from us three times in the past- Six weeks. Six weeks. That's terrible. We had oh my God, that's awful. Well, no, it's not just me though, it's, it's the community in general. Um, and so people are basically, because there's no consequences, it seems, with misdemeanors after so many times, uh, it's gotten to the point where I feel People are running around, they're able to create misdemeanors, and there's no consequence. And so they're mm -hmm. immediately brought back out onto the streets. And I just feel like in the state of Vermont, our first priority should be to protect the Vermonters and their safety, of course. But with that, if we could detain the repeated offenders somehow, possibly for three months, maybe six months, I'm not sure because I feel that there's probably addiction issues there, if mm -hmm. there mental health issues. Right. And if we could create a law that would both, number one, protect the community and their safety, but number two, detain these guys long enough, or girls, um, just to get clear-headed. If they mm -hmm. maybe for three months, that would give them enough time to get clear-headed or stabilize in some little way, that possibly then the next route could be they could get that step to mental health or to a rehab facility um and they actually might accept the help after a three-month period or four or six months you know i really don't know what the magic number is there but i just feel like right now there is no consequence well i'll just tell you what the gentleman told me he robbed us of a 200 dollars dollar all and nothing happened he got 200 bucks in what i missed oh, that cool. he took from us and, and it's, then, a, it's a piece of equipment. Piece of equipment. Then he came into our store and stole five hundred dollars of clothing. No, but, but and the then worst he laughed, part. No, but, wait, okay. The worst part was he had all this clothing and stuff in his hands. He looked at everybody in the store and literally ran out the front door in pure daylight in the middle of business hours, even with our customers. Right. So yeah. that was just really odd to me. <laughs> the and last then, one. And then the other night we were closed, and he came after hours with a restraining order. Looked in the window, Lynn was working. I was working. Stole the Weird Girls after he brought the dollar store to just before that. And he went down there. And I went down, I grabbed him, I held him down so the police came. 20 minutes later, Roger's guys came down. And when I was on the ground, he said, I can't be arrested. They can't arrest me. And by God, they didn't. They, no, let, him, they let him walk right away. But before, and the sheriff, that, uh, before that, he threatened his life, our family's life, and our business. Right. Now, mm. 
That's awful. I know it's awful. I honestly, I feel bad for the guy. I, I think he needs help. And honestly, if you look at his record, and I'm not just pinpointing this one. This is, I'm just using this as an example because it's a true fact. It's yeah. actually happened. He's, he's been in uh, interaction with the police at least 70 times in the past two years, I think. And I'm like, how does somebody even get to that level? And how do they keep just not getting detained? How do they, when he robbed us for the third time no. after closing, with me still working the store, which was quite frightening, um, you know, he had a restraining order. So the cops put the handcuffs on him, and then he got the handcuffs taken off of him, and he continued to walk down Route 15 after he just threatened us, our family, our business, and he stole from us for the third time with a restraining order on him. So I'm not saying that to be mean, but that's a fact. And we're worried for him too because it's going to escalate to the point where he wants to go to jail. He's stolen cars. He's going to kill a kid. He's going to do something that's going to be terrible. And the laws aren't protecting us or him. I guess that's well, they're not it. helping. Him. They're not helping him, but they're not protecting us neither. So, what, what could we do about this? Well, first of all, that's horrible. I mean, I just can't imagine having that happen constantly uh, with no uh, no uh, protection. But. I, I hate to say this, but it's not anything that I can deal with in Washington. I mean, criminal conduct is all state law, and enforcement is all state and local. And um, you know, we've got a number of your legislators on on the, on the phone call, uh, so you're going to have to take it up with them. But it's not it's not anything that in Washington we're going to be able to um, help with, because well, it is a state law function. I would just like to add, for your knowledge, is um, I did talk to legislatures. Uh, Dan Noyes was very kind to reach out to me. So I talked to Todd Shubta as well. And um, the laws are in effect, but what's happening, it's not happening in the judicial area. Right. Where, no, that's a problem. Why is I mean, that happening? I'm just curious. Why well, is I think it's, 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 I mean, this is, uh, Rod, I, can I inject, uh, can I butt in? Yeah. Um, so, Congressman Welch, this is a, a a rule three situation where it's certainly a continuation of the offense, but not in a traditional sense. So um, I agree with you that that we do have to talk with our legislators. I've talked to uh, uh, one today, and and perhaps a little later in this this phone meeting we can bring it up again. But uh, uh, yeah, we just need to um, to figure what what we can do with these one man crime waves. Uh, when they're just, um, you know, misdemeanor yeah. after misdemeanor after misdemeanor. So uh, um, we will have to get a game plan, as you said, on a state level. Yeah, well, I, I, I really wish you luck. That is an incredibly terrifying story, and I know you're concerned about it too, Roger. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I just want to last thing I want to say is I'm not just saying that for us. I'm, I'm concerned for the entire public. Sure. For everybody, no, every, it's not just about yeah. us and our story. It's about the community too. Yes, yeah, very much. Okay, thank no, that you. really cuts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn Allen. Uh, and Jessica Bigford from the chat had asked, uh, "Do you know of any efforts to support mental health uh, at the federal level?" Well, I do. I, you know, I, I think there should be mental health parity, and we really don't have that at the federal level. And I also think that the mental health uh, issues that are going to be associated uh, with this pandemic are going to uh, grow. Uh, I mean, this is tough because the world as people knew it has been uh, turned upside down. And uh, uh, I just think about all these folks who had jobs and now don't, and all these folks who have businesses and uh, I'm really wondering whether it's going to uh, survive. There's an enormous amount of stress, and stress really does uh, uh, create a lot of mental health challenges. So uh, the state aid that we send back, I mean, uh, Richie on the uh, Appropriations Committee is going to be able to decide with others uh, how to allocate that, and that could be include supporting uh, our mental health uh, our provider system. And it's already stressed in Vermont. I know that. Um, so it, it, that, that, that would be a potential way to get the resources that would help. All right. And, uh, 
Thank you, Congressman. I really, we all really appreciate you taking your time here. I know we're a little bit over the uh, time you had planned to give us tonight. So uh, if there's any final remarks, um, nope. is that well, the time? you know what, it, it, we can do this again. I got to say, I really enjoy this. Okay. And it's, uh, it's really quite remarkable because uh, you can, we can have a lot of good interaction uh, from home and none of us have to get in the car. And, and uh, I, I just appreciate how uh, your community is so engaged. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. And the only thing that's going to get us through this um, is a solidarity with one another. And when you live in a community where you can get so many people on uh, this Zoom call for a in effect a community discussion, uh, that gives me a lot of hope. Uh, my job, as I was saying, is to try to get the resources back here. Uh, we've got the legislators, um, and it will be their job to make the decisions about how to allocate them. Uh, I do want to, you guys have been on the forefront of broadband, and I'm hopeful that we can have some uh, breakthrough on that sooner rather than later because of how essential broadband is and how everyone has seen how essential it is in this crisis. Um, and uh, uh, whatever it is we pass, it's not going to be enough. Uh, whatever it is we pass is probably going to have some things in there that, uh, uh, that, that I won't like. I like those uh, loss carry back provisions. Uh, but as I told you, I'm going to err on the side of doing everything I can to have this money go to the communities and go to the individuals and go to the small businesses. So I'll keep at it. I'll do my best. And I look forward to uh, further uh, interacting with you guys. Really enjoyed this. Again, thank you very much for coming tonight. Yeah, and I want to thank the legislators there, and they're good partners uh, uh, to work with. You guys are all well represented. We think, uh, thank you, Congress. You're doing a pretty great job. I'd like to turn it over to Eric Oskett. It, and again, thank you, uh, Congressman, for joining us tonight. Uh, it was a, a great discussion, and I hope you didn't you know, find it a waste of your time. It's certainly valuable oh to us. Oh my God, <laughs> say that. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, you guys are, you know, doing the real work. It, 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 it's, I, you know, I, I just want to last say this. I feel lucky having this job. I hate what's going on now. I'm really worried about uh, people's health and, and in a lot of ways I'm worried about our country with what's going on in DC. But to have a job to represent people like you, Vermonters, and to have an opportunity to try to be helpful uh, uh, is a blessing, you know, and I feel very, very lucky to have this job. Well, one of the reasons we put this together was for the mental health of the, our community, giving uh, people an outlet, communication, keeping the communication open line uh, going, and we always end it with some entertainment. You're more than welcome to stick around for that as well. All right. Who's entertainment tonight? Well, one of our local citizens, which has always been a local citizen, plays an instrument. Or last week we had bagpipes. Uh, we've had a whole variety of different things. Uh, at this point, I guess I'd like to turn it over to Lisa. Our Thank you, Eric. Thank you. That's it. it there we go. All right. Well, as we know, May is um, National Bike Month, and we've seen lots of people out biking, which is a really nice COVID-19 activity because you get a lot of space from one another. Tomorrow morning, the Neighbors Helping Neighbors will be at the Lamoille County Field Days. They start handing out food at 9, planning to go until 10, or as long as the food lasts. So it's first come, first serve. You will need to um, remain in your car with a mask on, and please give the volunteers appropriate space. Um, the governor declared that recreation areas can open um, at a meeting this week. Ours are not reopened yet. We meet Monday morning at 11 to discuss reopening them, and updates will be posted on the Donson Recreation Facebook page, on our website, and um, on the town's page, I'm sure. So stay tuned for a safe reopening plan of our skate park and playgrounds. Um, and for May, we've started a virtual, virtual, Eric, I can hear you. 
a virtual race challenge. <laughs> um, so enter any virtual race. Um, there's lots and lots of them online. Enter any virtual race, complete it. Let me know you have by emailing me at the website here or at the email here. Um, and you will be entered for a chance to win a gift prize from Ebenezer's bookstore. So I'd like to turn it over to Kyle Noose. She's going to introduce tonight's musical act. Uh, Kyle, I'm gonna bring you up. Uh, before we get into the music, uh, Sheriff Mark, who would like another couple minutes. Um, so I don't know if you had anything else going, Kyle, or if we're ready, to, if we can turn it over to Sheriff Mark for a minute and then come back. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, uh, Sheriff, I've unmuted you. Okay, uh, thank you. I just wanted to once again uh, bring up the issue of this uh, uh, situation that occurred the other night at uh, uh, Johnson Farming Garden. So uh, I hope our legislators are still on the line. I spoke to uh, uh, Dan this morning, but uh, the situation is is that uh, law enforcement and prosecutors uh, can't do, cannot lodge, cannot put someone in jail uh, when they are when they have committed a misdemeanor crime, which is a petty crime, shoplifting or something like that, uh, that is not committed in the officer's presence. The situation, though, is that we have somebody that is going in several businesses a day and stealing uh, from them, and uh, the only option available to police is to cite them to go to court. There's no arraignments uh, uh, going on right now until, I believe, in June. So uh, there's no deterrence for someone that's uh, either got mental health problems or drug problems or uh, uh, just likes having us chase him around. So this is a situation that we're in, um, and and this situation is occurring in in several counties, uh, um, according to to my uh, uh, sources in Montpelier. And uh, we need to have a discussion about how to protect the victims. And uh, it can't always be about. Uh, um, the offenders, um, and I am, I'm, I myself have have uh, uh, performed in my duties um, in consideration of people that uh, sometimes need a second chance and deserve a second chance. But but we also have a responsibility to protect the public. So um, I, I told the lawyers that I would speak out tonight, and I am, and I will work with the legislate, legislators. I, I hope that they contact me on this. And uh, and certainly the lawyers will, will uh, certainly voice their concerns. So uh, that's basically what I've got to say. I've got a question from chat, uh, Roger. Uh, Eric Hutchins has asked, uh, isn't it grand larceny if it's more than $900, which would be a felony? Yes. But what we have is is somebody going in and stealing a soda, or or maybe there are some uh, 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 you know uh, grain larceny related um, uh, incidents. But the majority of the time, it's it's these misdemeanors, and we can't do anything about them. And they're, they're letting people out of jail right now. They're not putting any more in because of the COVID, uh, COVID situation. So uh, we're, we're certainly uh, um, we're certainly we we don't have the tools that we need to be able to deal with this. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roger. And uh, with that I think we're ready for the entertainment. So, Kyle, I'm going to turn it back over to you properly. Okay. Thank you. Well, I get the fun job of introducing tonight's um, local entertainment, who happens to be my sister, Liana. Um, she hails from Johnson, but she's um, been living in Edinburgh, Scotland for the last two years, getting her master's in music therapy. And tonight, she and her partner are going to play a couple of tunes for us on cello and guitar. She's a cellist, and he plays the guitar. 
Um, but she also creates um, a lot of her own um, her own original compositions. Um, so I think one of those will be played and then also a more traditional Scottish tune. So with that, I would like to introduce Liana. Great, thank you. Uh, really nice to be there over there with you guys, seeing some familiar faces, um, even though I'm over here in Scotland right now. Um, and as Kyle said, I'll start with one of my own tunes, which believe it or not, this is probably the most upbeat tune I've written. So um, I'll start with that. And then um, my partner Douglas will join me for a song that hopefully some of you are familiar with and uh, feel free to sing along to that one if you want. next one I'll move to the cello and as I've been over here um, I really love uh, the traditional kind of New England roots folk music but I've also been able to um, learn a lot of traditional Scottish tunes which of course is linked um, so we're going to do um, a tune you may recognize oh yeah <laughs> Oh, 
you very much and uh yeah thank you for for uh i guess you'd be staying up late there so uh, yeah. thank you for uh, staying up to participate with us sure no problem just remind everyone next week we will have as a featured speaker the secretary of education daniel french so uh that might be interesting for everyone other than that hope everyone has a nice mother's day weekend for all you mothers out there good night Good night. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>